Hello and welcome to the podcast. This is Ron's Amazing Stories, where we play tales to take you away from today. On the program today, we have eight stories and a visit from Sylvia. That sounds amazing. Hence the name of the podcast. We have a watermelon truck, part two of Rivals, a real head-scratcher that I can't explain. Bigfoot is back, Grandma is proud, a pretty baby, and a white witch. Are you serious? I am. And we end the show with another brand new, not-so-important times in history. Incredible! Are you ready to get started? Yeah! Let's do this. And now, a new two and a half minute mystery. This two and a half minute mystery is being brought to you by Scott Rickoff. Scott lives in Eden Prairie, Minnesota, and this is his second submission to the Two and a Half Minute Mystery. Oh, and it's much appreciated. Now, here is our story. A large Winnebago pulled out to pass a slow-moving car and was hit head-on by a semi-truck and a water. The truck driver died instantly. Road Rash Ron, the driver of the motorhome, and Skidmark Marty, one of the two Winnebago passengers, were also found dead at the horrifying scene. Shady Sean, the lone survivor and witness to the accident, is sitting on the ground by the side of the road with his back to the mangled metal. Detective Peters arrives on the scene. Only Shady Sean was unharmed. His legs shook with a nervous twitch as he described to the detective what happened. Well, sir, Skidmark and I were in the back of the bus, drinking beer and playing some Texas Hold'em. He stood up to get another beer, and the next thing was the crash, and he went flying. He was thrown hard against the back of the Winnebago and was killed when his head hit the doorknob. The only reason I didn't get hurt is I was lucky to be sitting down and I hung on to that table for dear life. Peters took a minute and looked over the scene. Seconds later, he threw cuffs on Shady Sean and read him his rights. Shady Sean, I'm arresting you for the murder of Skidmark Marty. Now, do you know why Detective Peters arrested Shady Sean. In just a minute, we'll have our solution. But first, a message from our sponsor. Do you enjoy these two and a half minute mysteries? Please let me know. Also, if you have one to share, I'd love to hear it. Go to ronsamazingstories.com and click on the contact tab. And now, here is our solution. Did you figure it out? Our detective became suspicious of the fatal blow to the back of Marty's head. You see, the answer comes from the world of physics. Shady Sean claimed that on impact, Skidmark Marty was thrown to the back of the Winnebago, hitting the rear doorknob. However, in truth, on impact, his body would have been thrown forward. How about that? This two-and-a-half-minute mystery was brought to you by Scott Rickoff. Scott hails from Eden Prairie, 12 miles southwest of downtown Minneapolis in Hennepin County. It is the 12th largest city 
in the state of Minnesota. Thank you, Scott. Last week on the podcast, we had an epic listener story called The Toil Bridge sent in by Alexander Short. Podcast friend and monthly co-host Sylvia Schultz not only loved the story, but knew it quite well. She is currently writing a new book that includes the complete story of that ill-fated train and includes the ghostly encounters that followed. She also informed me that the bridge was called the Tay Bridge, not Toil, and it actually happened on December 28, 1879, which, by the way, matches perfectly with Alex's dream or time slip encounter. I found an article on the Courier UK division that ties up the tale and answers all of the questions about the crash and its aftermath. You can read this article on this week's blog, but if you want to know about the ghostly encounters afterward, you'll have to wait until Sylvia's book is released. Now I know I can't leave you hanging like that, so I will tell you this. Sylvia texted me this. You may be interested to know that the bridge has a recurring haunting. If you stand on the shore near the Tay Bridge at 7.15 p.m. on the anniversary of the collapse, you can see ghostly lights of a phantom train. I want to thank Alex for his incredible story and to our favorite librarian for her amazing knowledge of creepy historical events. Now, if you missed Alex's story, you can find it in episode number 436 of the show. Thank you, Alex, and thank you, Sylvia. By the way, Sylvia will be joining us for a new ghost story segment in just a few minutes. And now, here is our weekly edition of Audible. Today's podcast is brought to you by Audible. Get a free audiobook and a 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com slash Ron's Amazing Stories. They have over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, computer, Kindle. Whatever you have, you can listen to Audible on it. So what am I listening to right now? Last week, I told you about rivals, frenemies who changed the world. The response I got from you guys was off the charts. You liked the demo so much that you went and bought the book. Well, this week, I've got to tell you about rivals too, more frenemies who changed the world. Now, I could tell you about rivals all over again, but we already did that last week. So this time I'm going to play a promo reel from Audible Originals that I think tells it all. Oh, Mom, can I play Fortnite? (laughs) (laughs) Hey there, Buster. (laughs) I just listened to Audible's original Rivals 2 with my friend. Was it sad? funny. Was it scary? Watch and find out. Team Medicine. Team Tesla. But what makes the War of the Current so fascinating is that it would determine the fates of the two most famous inventors of the 19th and 20th centuries, Thomas Edison and Nikola Tesla. I'll take who invented the light bulb for 300. True or false? Thomas Edison invented the light bulb. False. It's a trick question. Trick question. Deaf? What do you mean I'm deaf? You people are all just talking quietly to make me paranoid. Tesla did it with one of his death beams. I'm sure of it. If we can force enough of these electrons to move from atom to atom, we can create a current, which can be used to power things like light bulbs or video games. Cool. Can I play Fortnite now? 
One way to create a current is to use a battery. Hello, ladies. And generally not living up to his potential. Now you can have more rivals today. Here's what Audible has set up for us. They are offering a free audiobook and 30 days to give you the opportunity to check out their service. To download your free audiobook, go to audibletrial.com slash Ron's Amazing Stories. Again, that's audibletrial.com slash Ron's Amazing Stories, and you can get your copy of Rivals or Rivals 2, More Frenemies Who Changed the World. Thank you, Audible. And now, it's time for your stories. These are your stories, sent by you, for you. story this week is a short but crazy tale sent in by Dean Gardner from Norfolk, Virginia. Now I learned something on this one. I've always thought it was North Fork and was surprised to learn that it's Norfolk. How about that? Here is Dean's story. Hello Ron, I have a head scratcher tale for you. I hope you can use it. I love the podcast and never miss an episode. My new favorite thing is the Audible commercials. I became a subscriber and have used my monthly credits to get all but one of your recommendations. Thank you for that. My story has no explanation that I can come up with. Bottom line, my parents have a haunted home and the ghosts are either family or people who just like us a whole lot. There have been encounters, strangeness, and unexplainable things over the years However, this event defies logic. It was May of 1999, and my sister and I were 10 years old at the time. We were playing in the backyard with my older cousin Mark when we heard the explosion. The kitchen blew up. That's the only way to describe it. My mother and her sister were baking cookies when the place exploded. My dad and Uncle Pete had gone fishing, and that accounts for everyone involved. We ran into the house, and it was filled with smoke and debris from the explosion. My mother was on the floor in the living room, and Mark quickly pulled her outside to safety. My aunt was nowhere to be found. After what could have only been two minutes or less, the fire department arrived and took over the scene. They found my aunt in the kitchen, and she was taken to the hospital. Mother woke up and only had some minor injuries. After all was said and done, the firemen applauded our quick thinking and our call to 911. But here's the problem. None of us called 911. There's more. Later, we found out that the call to 911 came from our phone and it occurred a full five minutes before the explosion occurred. Who made that call from our house and how did they know what was going to happen? Nobody knows. Most everyone I tell my story to says that it must have been a timekeeping error. But that still doesn't explain who made the call. Dean Gardner, Norfolk, Virginia. Well, Dean, that is a head-scratcher for sure. And I certainly don't have any explanation for it. It does sound like that house of yours has some very helpful spirits. Thank you for sharing your story with us. It is amazing. Our next story comes from Michigan and was posted on the website by Harold King. In 1974, my parents moved my little brother and I from greater Detroit all the way up north to the rural town of Elk Rapids. My father bought a small roadside motel. This place was magical for me as a five-year-old, There were snakes, turtles, and frogs. All of this natural world was just for me. Looking back, I'm amazed at how much land my parents owned. 
even owning some footage on Lake Michigan. I mention this because the beach itself was about a half a mile behind the hotel, with a thick, dense forest in between. Can't stress enough for those of you who aren't familiar with this area, and how far away it is from it all. So much so that my dad learned that there was a Native American family living on his land in the forest. They needed to access the hand pump in the barn in order to have water. So it was during one of those warm summer nights with all the windows open that I shot out of my bed like a cannon. Again, I was five at the time. I can't say what got me up in the middle of the night. It was definitely late, everyone was sound asleep, and there was an eerie dead silence. I remember being frightened and that I had to get to my parents' room as quickly and as quietly as possible. I saw that my parents' bedroom window was open. I remember their sheer curtains billowing out from the breeze. I stood at the doorway to their room watching them sleeping and then walking to the window. It faced the courtyard of the motel, and there was light shining in from the full moon that night. I remember the scene so vividly. It was then that someone or something came to the window and was looking at me. I could not see its face. It was completely blacked out in silhouette. All I could see was a halo of long, thick hair all lit up by the moon behind it. The sight of it broke me from my spell, and I ran across the room, diving in between my parents. I lay there being as quiet as possible, knowing that it was watching me. There was no sound. I remember that my dad was on his side like a wall between me and whatever it was at the window. I would slowly peek my head over a few times, and each time, it was still there. At some point, I must have fallen asleep. That experience was a turning point for me, and not in the best way, because from then on I really struggled to sleep on my own, and I was always trying to sneak into my parents' bed. I really dreaded going to bed, even when my brother and I started sharing a room. Looking back, I wish I would have said something to them at that moment. It was years later as an adult. I was back at my parents' motel. On that trip, I finally came to terms with it all. I saw Bigfoot again crossing the parking lot. I felt no fear then, just awe for seeing something few in this world get to experience. As I write this, I think about that moment when I stood at my parents' door, and I finally realize how exciting it really was. Harold King, Michigan. We've had so many types of Bigfoot stories over the years. Each is so very different. From good Bigfoot to evil Bigfoot. Never is it the same. Is Bigfoot a monster or friend? Simple creature or an intelligence with an agenda? I fear we're never going to have that answer. But I do thank you for your story, Harold. It is a good one. We all love a good story, but what we truly crave is a ghost story. It's time now for Ghost Stories with Sylvia. Sylvia Schultz is a librarian and author by day. But at night, she becomes a ghost hunter. Following a lifetime spent in the pursuit of the weird and the strange, her non-fiction works include Ghost of the Illinois River, Fractured Spirits, 44 Years in Darkness, Hunting Demons, and The Spirits of Christmas. We now cross over the veil and join Sylvia as she tells us more tales from the unknown. Hello, Ron. 
John, how are you? How'd you know it was me again? Oh, well, I always take a look at who's calling. Yeah, I know, but I don't believe it. I think you're psychic. <laughs> oh, I do not claim to be psychic. No, I think you are. You knew it was me. You didn't look at your phone and say, oh, it's Ron calling. <laughs> Well, it's just because I look forward to our chat so much. Ah, I see. <laughs> All right, so how's life in uh, Illinois? Uh, it's good. It's finally warm, and I think it's going to stay warm, so I'm going to be able to get out in my garden pretty soon. And my pear tree has pears on it. I'm so excited. And, uh, yeah, it's good. Life's good. So what are the chances that the Chicago Cubs are going to start playing anytime soon? Uh, not good, I'm afraid. <laughs> Maybe they'll just have to play games without audiences like they do in Korea. Yeah. Now, do you have any pull with them to get them playing? I really need the, I need the Cubs, man. I need them. Oh, uh, well, I don't follow sports myself, but y you do you, man. Yeah. Well, I understand that. But do you have any pull with them? That was the question. Not if you like it. Oh, because, because I'm in Illinois. That's I, right. I don't really. Yeah. <laughs> you don't own the team or anything? You can't help me out. No, no. I don't, I don't even have season tickets. I mean, I'm just a nobody. So how's your family doing? Is I know you've got the dogs. Do you have a husband back yet? Uh, my husband is back, yes. Oh, he good. was He was over two months in first Georgia and then South Carolina working on Nuclear power plants, keeping them running. So he was considered an essential worker. So I bet you're glad to have him back then. I am, yes. And how's your family? How's Jim doing these days? My brother Jim is doing pretty well. He's on a new oh, schedule man. these days, so he now has his afternoons free, which he is extremely happy about. <laughs> and Who wouldn't be? I talked to him on the phone today. Yeah? And you know what that means. Oh, I'll bet that means he had another question. He always has the best questions. He does. Well, you know, I don't know if I told you this, but he's brilliant. He is mm. like genius level brilliant. Wow. Yeah, I know. And he's probably right now <laughs> listening to this and going, no, I'm not. But he is. <laughs> <laughs> he really is. But Ron's your brother and he's allowed to brag on you. So That's there. right. I'm allowed take to brag. It, take it. Accept it gracefully, Jim. Yeah. All right. So. He does have another question for you, and okay. this time his question isn't so much about ghost hunting or spiritual interactions, if you will, as it is a question of logistics. You want to hear it? Yeah, lay it on me. All right. Questions from Jim. We all hear each time the show starts that you are a librarian by day and a ghost hunter by night. One must impact the other. How does the world of the librarian impact the world of the ghost hunter or vice versa? Now, he told me that he was a librarian in college, which I didn't know, by the way, and understands oh. the precision that is required for that job. Does being a librarian help or hinder your second life of ghost hunting? <laughs> well, Jim, that's a great question. As always, I think that being a librarian and a ghost hunter at the same time is really a wonderful thing because being a librarian has taught me how to do research. And being a ghost hunter, that the ghost hunter side of me gets to have all the the benefit of that research. And there's also the purely selfish fact that, I mean, it's not just because I'm a librarian. Anybody could walk in off the street and do this because there's a wonderful thing, as I'm sure you know, called interlibrary loan, where you can get a book from anywhere. You ask for a book, they will get it for you. And that just feeds my reading addiction and my ghost story addiction. There's also the fact that patrons at the library know full well what I do in my spare time. <laughs> and they will come to me with ghost stories, experiences they've had, and they ask me for advice on experiences and, and situations that they have. Um, there's a fellow who comes in 
quite often, and he is in the process of remodeling a business building. And he's told me about the ongoing experiences he's had there. And there was one experience that it's a very physical thing. It's basically when it snows, there's always a huge, huge, huge amount of snow on the porch and the mailbox. And the mailbox is always open. No matter how many times he closes the mailbox at this place, it's always (laughs) open. And there's also a huge amount of snow on the porch disproportionate to the rest of the landscape of the yard. And he said the women that owned the building before him noticed the same thing. And he said, Is you any, have you ever heard anything about that? And I said, well, very natural, physical phenomena like that used to be a really big part of 19th century ghost story telling and ghost lore. You don't find it all that much in 20, 20th and 21st century ghost lore, but it was a big part of 19th century ghost lore. So I just thought that was terribly interesting that somebody in the 21st century would pick up on something that used to be a thing back in the day. It, it's just, it's really a pleasure to talk with him. So yeah, it, people come in and talk to me and I get that in a different profession but I don't think I would get as much of it in a different profession because people trust librarians. People trust that we know what we're talking about. And that gives me a certain amount of respect in the community. So when people hear me talking about ghost stories and the research I've done, they tend to take me seriously, which is really great. I think that something he said just tripped in my mind when you were talking and that he talked about the precision that is required in that job. And I think you just hit on it. You have to be right. You can't be wrong. Yeah. Because you're going (laughs) to mess someone up if you're not. How do you deal with that? Oh, I'm very lucky in that respect because I am not a reference librarian. I'm a circulation librarian. What is your job, Sylvia? Now, I think you mentioned to me today that you were doing something on social media for the library. Is that right? Uh, I contribute to the library's social media posts, but I'm not in charge of posting anything like that. My title is circulation specialist. We determined that uh, last year, I believe they went through the job postings of, or job listings of everyone who worked at the library. And it was decided that my job title was circulation specialist. What is a day like for Sylvia Schultz at the library? Oh, I process the magazines when they come in. When the mail gets delivered, I pull the magazines out and process them and put them out for circulation. Check books in. Um, I've got a desk shift for two hours every day and I get to talk to people, get to chat with them when they come in. I get to help them if they have problems. I get to make sure their books are checked out properly. And if people ask for something on interlibrary loan, I make sure that they are getting the right item. That's that's about it. It's a lot of hands-on with the books, which is wonderful. I think that's fascinating. And you've been doing that for a long time now, right? Didn't you say like? Almost 23 years. It'll be 23 years in August. Wow. And how many books do you think you've handled? Oh, (laughs) well, when we moved to the new building, we got 30,000 new items. Uh I was just told the other day by our director that we have 10,000 items checked out right now, which were... In the next week, we're going to be able to let people return some of those. So there's 10,000 items just checked out. How many books have I handled personally over the years? <laughs> it's It's got to be in the hundreds of thousands, if not million by now. Wow. Upper six figures. <laughs> All right. So give me an idea. What is your view of the 2020 library? What is it now? It's changed so much. It has. We do so much online, especially with what's going on now where libraries are closed. Where It's weird being a library during this whole plague nonsense because you would think that libraries would be consider, considered essential services. And we are. We are vital to the community. Mm-hmm. But by their very nature... Libraries are a place where people congregate. They're a place where people go to feel safe. Mm -hmm. And that's the whole thing. You can't feel safe right now with a lot of people all together in one place. So we had to close. 
we had Wi-Fi available in the parking lot. If people wanted to come and sit in their cars and use our Wi-Fi, they could. We had virtual library cards. We had people applying for cards online, which is something we've never done before. We had a lot of people checking out books and movies through digital means, uh, not only audiobooks, but books on ebooks and um, music and movies over the internet. So yeah, we're, we're, we're really, we're pivoting. Hmm. <laughs> we're making it work. And we're, we're looking at doing the summer reading program in much the same way, a virtual summer reading program. We have kids getting points, not only for reading, but reading to grandparents, reaching out to the more vulnerable members of society and reconnecting with family. They get points for that. We have a geocaching thing going oh. on where people follow clues and um, do a treasure hunt outside <laughs> and, and get points for that. It's really exciting. It's scary, but it's really exciting to be in the library biz right now mm. because we're moving so fast and we're still helping so many people. Our buildings are closed, but we're more than just a building. Mm-hmm. I guess to close this out, I'm going to say thank you for your service, Sylvia. Absolutely. Absolutely. Anything that we can do to help is something that we want to do. That's just, it sounds incredible. Now, we do have an email. Oh, okay. I think this is kind of neat because I think the email ties into what my brother asked. Ooh, really? So, you ready for What's it? What's the email? Okay, I'm going to just read it straight out. It says, Ron... I have a question for your ghost hunting segment, and I'm assuming that's Ghost Stories with Sylvia. I have just hooked up with a local group here in Everett. It is a fledgling group, and we're just figuring things out. We are using books and videos to help us along the way. One of the books is Ghostology, The Art of the Ghost Hunter by Stephen T. Parsons. You go to so many places and seem to have so much fun doing it. How do you find out about your locations, and is there a community of hunters that share this type of information? Right now, we're not meeting, but we hope to get back to it as soon as the governor says we can. Sabrina Jacobs, Everett, Washington. Good question, actually, I think. It is, and it does sort of dovetail with Jim's question. Sabrina, thank you for your question. I'm really excited to hear that you have formed a group. We need everybody we can going out and exploring and investigating. Uh, as far as your actual question goes, I find out places to go. I've been ghost hunting for over a decade now. So I find out in a couple of different ways. I have friends in the ghost hunting community that hit me to tours or places they're going and they say, hey, do you want to come along? So that's really a wonderful way to do that. There are so many ghost hunting groups on Facebook that you can ask for advice and they're usually happy to share it with you. There are also tours that you can go on to get experience that's going to cost you money most likely it depends on what your budget is and if you can go to a more expensive place with more members of your group so more people kicking in some scratch for it the the less the price per person goes down if you are interested in doing private home investigations Put yourself out on Facebook and say, we are a new group and we are interested in doing investigations. We don't charge. I've heard of groups charging for investigations. I really, for private home investigations, I think that's reprehensible. I, I think agree. it's disgusting. I really don't think you should do that. If you're doing home investigations, you are there to help that person. Someone has come to you for advice and help and possibly they're really scared. Ghost hunting scares some people. Paranormal activity scares some people. And if they've contacted you four times out of five, they want answers and they want your help either dealing with the problem or getting rid of the problem. So I would definitely say if you're going to set yourself up as a private 
home investigation team, please, 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 please do not charge for your services. <laughs> Just use it as learning experience. Use it as a way to test out new equipment and use it as a way to connect with the people who live there and the people who previously <laughs> lived there and find a way to help everyone get along because that's why you're there. You're there to give the current inhabitants of the house answers about the previous inhabitants of the house. I do have an absolute blast at the places I go to. The one thing I would say is don't rely too much on what you see on TV for guidance. <laughs> <laughs> I was listening to a very good friend of mine, Dale Kazmarek. He did a, a Facebook live stream today and he was talking about shows. I tuned in in the middle of it. But he said, I've never understood why these shows, they show something weird happening and then the people run off in the, in the opposite direction. He said, you're there to investigate. <laughs> That's the entire reason you're there. Don't. If you're going to run, run towards it. <laughs> and I have seen ghost hunters do just that. I have been in a church that was very haunted, and we heard a strange noise coming from down the hall, and a friend of mine took off booking towards the noise. <laughs> I was so proud of him for doing that. So, uh, yeah, if something strange happens, if you start to get nervous, remind yourself that's why you're there mm -hmm. to investigate, to learn, to try and find answers. I hope that answered your question. Best of luck with your group and, and have fun with it. That's that's we're exploring the unknown and there's there's nothing more exciting than that. Well, let me try to dig something out of you here because I. I want to I want to know this. Okay. So, for instance, let's take the Valencia house, the axe murder mm. house. How in the world did you find that? Lots of reading. That's the other thing. I read about a lot of different places. There are ghost hunting field guides that you can look up. Look for titles like haunted places in Washington ah, or there haunted you go. places in the Northeast. <laughs> And if you're lucky, there are many, many guidebooks that will give you the address and the phone number and the website and the hours. If a restaurant's haunted, they'll tell you the hours of the restaurant and whether or not a place is open and still active. That's the, the real jewel if you can get your hands on something like that. I have just done a lot of reading about different haunted places. And of course, I've known about Velisca for a very long time. And I am friends with someone who does tours of haunted places. He gets groups together and they're just allowed free run of whatever place it is for six hours or eight hours or overnight or whatever it is. And I saw that he, he, was, he was taking a group to Velisca and I jumped on that. And that's how I got to experience an overnight visit at the Velisca Axe Murder House. So it's just a matter of keeping your eyes open and doing a lot of reading and being available to experiences when they come your way. What uh, can you tell us about a tour? Can you give us any idea of how much they cost? Uh, it really depends. I am going to... Penhurst in August. It is a, an abandoned mental asylum. I've heard of it. I believe the price for that tour is $75 a piece. Oh, that's not bad. Yeah. And also sometimes it depends on how many people go. There's, I think Edinburgh Manor is $1,200 for eight people. Oh yeah, I see. So if you can get a group of eight people together, you're fine. And nobody has to pay $1,200. It just really depends. The more renowned a place is, the more expensive it's going to be. I'm God's willing and the creek don't rise. I'm going to be going to Waverly Hills Sanatorium. I've heard of that one. In, yeah, <laughs> in June, mid-June. And I think the price for that was, I want to say that was 150 or 180 per person. Well, that's not bad either. It's not real bad. No, if you're if you're there and if you're at a place that's known to be active and you can get enough from your couch cushions to to, <laughs> to swing it, that's fine. I was absolutely thrilled to bits 
uh, I went to to Plymouth, Massachusetts in June a couple of years ago, and I discovered that uh, Fall River, Massachusetts is like 45 minutes away from Plymouth. And I discovered that the Lizzie Borden House did tours and investigations once a month. And the one for June happened to be during the week I was in Plymouth. Awesome. So I, I begged my host <laughs> to take me over to Fall River. And I got to go, and it was $75 for wow. eight hours. It wasn't an overnight, but it was eight hours in the Lizzie Borden house with a full investigation and everything. And that was amazing. Neat. I was thrilled to find that. So it just depends on the, the price of the venue and how many people you can c- get to come with you and stuff like that. Incredible. Yeah. Well, I want to say thank you, Sabrina Jacobs, for from Everett, Washington which is right near where I live, a few hundred miles away, but still right near where I live. And thank you for the question. much closer than where I live. (laughs) That's true. Thank you for your question. Thanks, Sabrina. Well, I think it's time to hear some ghost stories. What do you think? I think it's a wonderful time for ghost stories. Now, we just had Mother's Day not too long ago, and my understanding is that you have a couple stories here that relate to Mother's Day. Yeah, I was going through this my collection of stories, and a couple of them kind of popped out at me. And they're stories about mothers or mother figures or grandmother figures or grandmothers. So I, I collected a couple of them together, and I thought that I would share them for a little late Mother's Day gift for every every one of the mothers and grandmothers out there. Well, not too late. Why don't we start with the one that you have titled... Grandma's Proud. I just love this story. This story comes to us from a Reverend William Rauscher. He wrote a book called The Spiritual Frontier. He and a very good friend of his, Bob Lewis, went through seminary together. They went through all the classes. They went through all the hard coursework. And they also took their exams for the priesthood at the same time. Rauscher, the author of this book, passed, and that meant that he would be ordained a priest, and he was he was very happy about that. And he was hoping to find that Lewis had also passed, and he went to his friend's room to find out, how'd your exams go? When Rauscher arrived at Lewis's dorm room, Lewis said, you know, I, I've really been thinking a lot about my grandmother today and in the past couple of weeks because my grandmother was always so proud of me. He'd been raised by his grandmother. She was a devout Baptist, and she was an emotional woman who, whenever she was overwhelmed with joy or happiness, she would weep with joy. She would just, just end up bawling, and everyone loved her for it. And whenever Lewis did something that made his grandmother especially proud, tears. And it was just part of who she was. He recalled that when he told her that he was going to enter the ministry and study to become a priest, she shed more tears than he'd ever seen. Um, Lewis's grandmother had passed on. Uh, She'd been gone for about a year at that point. And Lewis told Rauscher that he couldn't help thinking how happy and proud of him that she would have been at that moment and how he wished that she were there to share his happiness with him because he did pass his his exams. He passed passed with flying colors, and he was also to be ordained. Lewis got up, and after the exams were, he was he just wanted to relax after the exams were finished, so he, he got up, and Rauscher was still in his room. They were chatting, and Lewis got up and loosened his tie and was going to toss it on the bed, and he looked at the, the photograph of his grandmother that he had on the dresser next to the bed. And Rauscher was sitting in a chair. He couldn't see anything different about the picture. But Lewis suddenly whirled around and said, what is going on? Who has been playing a joke? Who has been messing around with my grandmother's picture? And Rauscher assured Lewis that no one else had been in the room. And he got up from his chair and he said, what, what, what's going on? What's, is there something wrong? The photograph of Lewis's grandmother was soaking wet. <sighs> dripping with a small pool of water spreading on the dresser underneath it. And Lewis picked up the picture and looked, and they found out that it was wet inside the glass. Oh. 
The back of the picture, made of a dyed imitation velvet, was so wet that the velvet had streaked and faded. They took the frame apart. They've carefully peeled the wet photograph away from the glass and from the backing, and it didn't dry very quickly. And when it did, the area around the face remained a little puffy, as though the water had originated there and had run downward from the eyes in the photograph. Wow. And Lewis knew then that his grandmother knew of his forthcoming ordination and was so happy, so happy that she had cried. That gave me chills. Wow, 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 wow. What a great story. Yeah. I don't even have anything to say about that. That is incredible. I come from a long line of ministers Ah. myself. And in fact, if you were to really trace my tree back, I'm the only one that isn't a minister. Oh. My brother, he was in the ministry. I don't even know how many years, but he was a pastor for... Oh, my. Uh, he's retired now, but he's still doing it, even even though he's retired. Uh-huh. You, you never really retire from being a pastor, I think. <laughs> True. And, uh, and then it goes all the way back to the Reformation of Luther, you know, so... Oh, my goodness. So we've that got a lot of That is a pastors. long pedigree. Yeah, it is. So that this type of story means a lot to me, so... Thank you for that one. I'm glad I chose it. All right. Well, let's move on to your second story, which is called Pretty Baby. I'm interested to hear what this could be about. (laughs) Yes, this is a bit of a change of subject. This story comes to us from the Catfish Plantation Restaurant in Waxahachie, Texas. A young woman or young couple with a baby came into the restaurant and they happened to be the only patrons there at the time. So they sat down, the waitress seated them, they placed their order. It was kind of a cold, damp day and the windows of the restaurant were kind of fogged up. And the restaurant owner happened to be there and she came by the table to make sure everything was good. And she commented on how pretty that the baby was. She asked the baby's name, and the parents replied, her name's Alicia. About five minutes later, a waitress came up to the owner and said that the people with the baby wanted their check right away because they were leaving immediately. The mother said she was enjoying her meal when something on the window caught her eye. She looked over, and Alicia had been written in the condensation on the window. How did that happen? The parents left without finishing their meal. They said they asked the waitress to tell the owner it was lovely and the food was great, but they would never be returning to that restaurant. Wow. So, two great stories, Sylvia. Well, thank you. (laughs) I think that somebody uh, else thought the baby was pretty too. (laughs) (laughs) Well, you know, I've never thought that all babies are pretty, but they're pretty darn cute. That's that's where I put it. We can leave it at that. Yeah, sure. (laughs) I've seen some really pretty babies, and there are some that are just not that attractive. They just aren't. All right, I've got a quote for you now. Are you ready for a quote? Yeah. All right. So I'm going to give you a quote, and all you have to do is tell me where it's from. Okay. Do you think you can do it? Oh, I'll give it my best shot. You ready? Here it is. All right. The smell of freshly cut grass comes from the chemicals plants release when they're in distress. You monster. I know exactly who said that. Who said it? Who said it? That was me. (laughs) That was on my Today I Learned for Monday. Oh, was that your blog? (laughs) Isn't that just awful? I thought it was since it was beginning of uh, mowing season, I thought I would throw that out there. Yeah, it is true. Um, Plants have ways of communicating with each other. And that lovely cut grass smell that we enjoy so much is actually plants screaming. Also, I had a chance to listen to your current Lights Out podcast. Yeah. And it happens to be about the number 88 Pioneer Zephyr. Yeah. Great. It's it's actually short this time, but it's really good. (laughs) Oh. Thank you. Yeah, I grew up in Chicago, so I grew up going to the Field Museum and the Museum of Science and Industry. And when I was going there, the Zephyr was outside, and now they've moved it inside 
to keep it away from the elements. They did the exact same thing with the U505, which is what we're going to be exploring the next time. That's going to be a longer episode. And boy, oh boy, is it going to rock. Mm. And when's that one coming out? Uh, I'm hoping to get that done by the time this episode of Ghost Stories with Sylvia comes out. So be looking for that this week or the next week. And where would we go to find the blog and the Lights Out podcast? Pray tell. The best place to go is sylviaschultz.wordpress.com. And we'll be able to find both the wonderful quote about freshly cut grass and the (laughs) story of the number 88 Pioneer Zephyr, which is a very pretty looking train. It looks ultra modern for as old as it is. I know it's this beautiful art deco design and it's sleek and it just looks like it's going fast even when it's standing still. And if you're interested, folks, she's got a lot of neat pictures that really help you to see what she's seeing. So I highly recommend this podcast. And it's, I think, about a 15 minute podcast this time, something like that. Uh, Yeah, I think it came out at 20 minutes, but yeah, it's just one of the shorter ones. So, but it's packed. Just a little bitty one. It's packed. Good story with it, too. So Thank you. I don't want to give it away because <laughs> th- th- then why listen to it if I told you everything that was there? Yeah. There aren't that many stories about the Zephyr, but there are lots of stories about the U505. So I'm really looking forward to putting that together. Well, Sylvia, do you have any closing thoughts for us this time? Ah, uh, well, would you like another weensy little dessert of a ghost story? Sure. Let's have it. Okay. All right, this one is called Let's Play. There is a cemetery in York Village, Maine, called Old York Cemetery. And there is a witch's grave in the cemetery that is haunted by her spirit. Mary Miller Jason was a white witch. She was one of the wise women that knew a lot of herbal medicine. And she also actually did exercise demons from her neighbor's homes. She was very well respected. She was considered a witch, but a white witch. Locals have been encountering her spirit ever since she died in 1774. And she's never scared anyone. No one has ever gotten nervous around her spirit. She's a very gentle, benevolent spirit. No houses fell on her? (laughs) No. No, no no one's ever gotten scared in her presence. And in fact, her ghost has been said to push children in swings on a playground that's right across the street from the cemetery. Oh, so a beneficial ghost. Yeah. Hmm. Well, Sylvia, I think we've had another whale of a good time. We have. It's always a pleasure. (laughs) So I'm going to say, folks, uh, I'm going to say thank you to my brother Jim for providing the question and to Sabrina for her question. You guys, if you want to, we want to have your questions for these. And if we filled up the entire uh, segment with your questions, I think Sylvia would love that. That would be perfectly fine. Thank you, Jim, and thank you, Sabrina. With that, I leave you, and I say, thank you, Sylvia. And I'll leave the dog bark. (laughs) (laughs) She's such a good, loyal, protective dog. Yes, Mommy loves you even though you interrupt her radio show. Oh, that's terrible. What? (laughs) (laughs) Thank you, Sylvia. You're welcome, Ron. Have a lovely month. Ghost Stories with Sylvia is brought to you by Gladys Goodies. Great treats for your dog to eat. You know, I always have a great time talking with Sylvia, and together we learn all kinds of new stuff and hear some amazing stories. If you want to visit her on her own turf, head to sylviaschultz.wordpress.com. There you will find her blog and access to the podcast, Lights Out. Thank you, Sylvia. Gladys goodies are great treats for your dogs and cats alike. They are 100% natural and are nutrient-rich treats that pets love to eat. You can get these and some really cool swag for your dog and cat at gladysgoodies.com. And don't forget to use our promo code RONS, that's R-O-N-S, to get a 20% discount on all of your purchases. 
That website again is gladysgoodies.com. Not so important times in history. In this segment, we take a look at historical events that may otherwise go unnoticed. We look at history with a fish-eyed lens, giving a perspective that should provide no insight to anyone or any time. But it is historical, or hysterical, as the case may be. Join us now for this event in history. This time, we're going to talk about one of the most underwhelming battles of World War II. It took place on May 6, 1945 at Castle Eider, which is a small fortification in Austria used at the time by the SS. It was a prison for high-profile detainees. On May 6, 1945, peace was on the horizon and the Third Reich was collapsing. Heinrich Doibel, the German commander in charge of Dachau concentration camp and Eider Castle, committed suicide, which led to the retreat of the Schultzstaffel, or SS soldiers. One of the prisoners of the castle, a Yugoslavian freedom fighter, escaped and went looking for Allied troops to rescue the rest of the prisoners. He found an American armored column and got them to come with him. At the same time, Major Josef Gongel, an Austrian in the German army, had been collaborating with the Austrian resistance in the closing days of the war. He was also intent on freeing the castle prisoners and decided to surrender with his men to the Americans. A meeting was held and a strange agreement would take place. The Major and his Wehrmacht troops would fight alongside the Americans against the SS guards. The resulting battle of Castle Eider was hardly pivotal, but the SS faced not only their fellow countrymen and Americans with a Sherman tank, but there were also Austrian partisans and French prisoners joining in. It was a wonderful symbol of the unifying effect that the Allies had compared to the polarizing effect of the Nazis. The battle may not have been big, a maximum of a hundred men were involved, but it was vicious. The Sherman tank was destroyed and Major Josef Gangel was killed by a sniper. It was, however, the only time the American army fought alongside the German army in the entire war. The SS were defeated and they surrendered. The rest of the prisoners were released unharmed and returned to their native countries. That's it for this edition of Not So Important Times in History. episode number 437 and there are so many people that took part today scott rickoff alexander short sylvia schultz dean gardner harold king sabrina jacobs and even my brother jim i also want to thank gladys goodies and audible for their support wow so many folks if you want to follow the podcast or the blog just head to ronsamazingstories.com and all of the links shall be yours do you want to help the show? Tell your friends all about it, and please leave reviews or feedback wherever you listen. Pressing that follow or like button makes the podcast grow. Thank you for listening, and I hope you come again to find out what are Rob's Amazing Stories.